we now have an opportunity for questions or statements or uh, other contributions that people would like to make to the topic that we have at hand. Um, so uh, I know that we have two microphones that are moving around. It's difficult to see from up here, but uh, can I ask uh, if we have any questions to stick up your hand and we will provide a microphone so that we can then hear. So are there any questions? I should just start there. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm interested to know what are the prospects for hard minerals in the Indian Ocean? We've been talking about fish, about oil and gas, liquid minerals, but I know other countries are interested in liquid minerals like India and China. They are interested in hard minerals. What are the prospects for that? Thank you. Would like to ask? Would like to ask? Uh, Pakashem, uh, it's true that uh, a lot of uh, nickel, phosphorus, manganese, etc., manganese nodules, except especially, have been found over there. Uh, but I have not really gone deep into any study that I know that really covers, at least I have not, if somebody else is, uh, you're welcome to sort of answer. But uh, uh, these minerals are being uh, exploited, not at least uh, as far as I know at the commercial level, but there is, uh, it, it's being exploited for the sake of seeing how viable it is for commercial uh, uh, levels. Now, uh, the precise details, I'm sorry, I don't have at the moment. Perhaps there's somebody from the floor can add value. No. I think that we've struck the bottom of our answer on that. Well, uh, Lee. Sorry. I I don't want to try and answer that question. <laughs> Perhaps the ambassador can. I'm not sure what he knows about it. I want to ask a different question. Is that okay? Yes, please. Yep. Um, one of the things that struck me about the three presentations is the, um, if you bring those three stories together, is this idea of increased maritime user intensity, uh, particularly in some parts of our region. Uh, between fisheries, offshore oil and gas activity, um, and, and trade. And I know tomorrow we've got presentations on environment and so on to come, and also more on energy. But I wonder if uh, the panelists would like to comment on the maritime security implications of this multiple use and increase um, maritime user intensity issue, particularly in some parts of our region. Thank you. Dr. Gosh, you want to start? Uh, yes, uh, it is true. In fact, I found that uh, with the increase in maritime trade, uh, though there was no direct linkage, and I was trying to search out for the direct linkage, um, the reason for that uh, is that uh, maritime crime is of various types. You've got various types of crime going on. And uh, it is difficult to link it directly to the increasing trade. But the fact is that uh, the challenges are increasing uh, out at sea. And again, it depends. Uh, the biggest problem which um, many academics have is that uh, how do you precisely define asymmetric challenges, non-traditional challenges, transnational uh, um, uh, challenges, non-transnational challenges. Out. So there is a whole world of jargon out there. And most of the cases, one blurs into the other. The line of distinction is very less. And that is why I couldn't really find a direct correlation. However, having said that, I would like to say that uh, it, it has increased. For example, now I, uh, I come back to my favorite topic of piracy, which incidentally has gone down. Um, 
Uh, of course, the navies say it has gone down because of the navies, uh, but there is a host of reasons why it has gone down, especially uh, in the Horn of Africa. And uh, it might come up once the navies move off again, but that's a separate story. So you have piracy happening in a particular area, which has come down as far as the number of incidents are concerned. Earlier, piracy was there, very pertinent in the Malacca Straits. Again, that has been eradicated, or so we like to believe. Uh, it, uh, the number of incidents are negligible. You have uh, maritime terrorism. Again, let me just tell you, maritime terrorism, how the format of maritime terrorism is being changing. I mentioned it in my lecture, uh, in my presentation, sorry, in my presentation, that earlier, most of the government organizations, when you would talk to them about maritime terrorism, they would say, what are the statistics? And uh, you would quietly say that, look, yeah, it's about two to five percent, depends upon which um, study you look at. So it's just of the continental terrorism. So everybody would say, is it really worth looking at something which is just two to five percent? I mean, how much are you going to uh, give your resources into it? And then Mumbai happened, in which it became clear that you use the seas as part of the supply chain dynamics, as part of uh, trying to take resources from one place to the other so that you can have an incident at land, not necessarily at sea. Earlier, our concept used to be, well, is uh, a passenger ship going to be blown up? No, it's not. Uh, LNG uh, uh, is going to be blown up? No. In fact, we still don't know what will happen to a ship which gets blown up. Uh, if uh, LNG carrier, uh, science doesn't really know it, you'll be surprised to know. So there is, uh, um, uh, there should be a correlation, but we haven't yet found it. And maritime crime is increasing. And this, all that I would like to say is, can only be overcome if we cooperate within the Indian Ocean. I, I don't know whether I've given the answer, but that's what I thought I should say. I would like to just uh, add a few words and, and, and effectively attack the problem from a slightly different angle that Commando uh, Coordinator has, has posed. I, I think, obviously, uh, if, we, if we talk about the raise of the strategic prominence of the Indian Ocean um, uh, due to its uh, military strategic value and certainly what we try to discuss here in the panel of its uh, geo uh, geoeconomic value, uh, it certainly has profound geopolitical uh, uh, consequences. Uh, if, if we're talking about uh, opportunities to explore the resources that are buried at sea underneath or on the, on the, on the subsurface, whether we're talking about fish stocks, when we're talking about strategic raw materials or energy resources, it raises importance and prominence of regional players, particularly those who effectively control uh, respective EEZs that effectively um, cover areas that are rich with those uh, stocks, but it also increases subsequent interest of uh, other regional powers, distant and, and near, as well as external players. And that results uh, uh, often leads to power competition. Uh, hopefully it will not uh, lead to any, any form of confrontation, but obviously uh, from, from the point of, uh, of, of, of rereading re the threat environment, we're talking about growing perfusion of soft targets, if we're talking about commercial uh, application, uh, and, and, and the subsequent need to protect them, or in, in terms of power competition, uh, uh, the opportunity to deny the effective use of those areas, the areas of, of strategic importance uh, to, your, to your competitors. So there is clear geopolitical imperative that is built in, in uh, everything that we've been discussing with respect to this strategically important area. Dr. Palmer, row please. Thank you. I'd just also like to respond. I'm not sure if I'm actually responding to the question, but just an observation on um, what you mentioned about the intensity of um, or increased user intensity, especially in um, uh, the fisheries um, sector. So a lot of times we look at the distant water fishing nations and how um, illegal fishing by distant water fishing nations actually impact on the Indian Ocean countries. But within the Indian Ocean, there are also um, a certain illegal activities um, the, uh, 
are more or conflicts that are a result of increased user intensity. What we have in fisheries, what we call a um, migrant fishing. And these are fish, uh, fishermen within the same country but have migrated to another part or one part of the country to a province or another state to conduct uh, fishing activities because there is no more um, fish in their part. Um, of the country and they're called migrant fishers and there are certain instances where these migrant fishers are not welcomed and therefore you know local fishers would burn the boats of these migrant fishers and this actually occurs say between purseiners and gillnets um, purseine owners who burn um, the gillnets and even the boats of these operators so we 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 see not just an increase in a um, conflict but a transformation of the problem to a conflict that cannot be resolved under the fisheries regime and hence we need to look at it from a maritime security um, um, perspective and the list of you know potential issues offshore um, you know as um, Alexi is mentioning you know goes on what if a fishing vessel has actually approached an offshore um, platform um, and the fishing vessel is actually claiming that it's in distress. How would you respond to such a threat? And we are not prepared, as far as I know, to respond to such um, threats. So it's also wondering and trying to synthesize some of the issues that we've discussed, especially with the first um, session, you know, the use of risk assessment. And it's wondering if we can apply some of the risk assessment um, framework um, um, in, in or assessing some of the maritime security threats. and. And, and if we can um, have um, you know, a, a, a value for which the threats are actually low um, value threats um, that require a certain response. You know, as um, Dr. Ghosh is saying, you know, maybe these threats are not of significance to one country, but it is for another, then how, how do we respond? Or do we just discard you know, these um, threat. Some of the issues that I've discussed earlier, um, specifically on the alleged harassment of fishing vessels by naval vessels, for example, that I those incidents are not as prominent in this part of the region compared to the Southeast Asian region. But are we going to wait for such a big incident to happen, such as in the South China Sea where it's completely uncontrollable and you have Coast Guard officers being detained and being charged for um, homicide for having killed a Taiwanese fishing vessel you know in a disputed area so I think certainly there is a, um, there is a, you know a greater correlation maybe it's not as clear um, 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 because of the lack of, of studies, but there is certainly something there that we can um, look at in this um, forum. Uh, just a slight clarification of what Mary has said about uh, the relevance thing. I, m I, I think I must clarify that. Uh, when I mentioned theory of relevance, I was talking about it with respect to cooperation. I'll explain again. It essentially means that what is relevant to you, what is priority to you, need not necessarily mean that I have the same priority. When I gave the example, I gave the example of Australian immigration, or illegal immigration, rather. Now, as far as Australia is concerned, illegal immigration has the maximum priority, or it's pretty high in their level of priority. For them, it's a very important thing. Now, coming to India, there is illegal migration into India, through the seas also. But the question is, do we accord it the same priority? No. So what we have to keep in mind is, whenever we are talking of cooperation, is that we should form a network or a lattice in which we can talk at the same level. We keep it at the back of your mind, uh, at the back of our mind that look, it, th the threats that I am talking of, which may be very important to me, need not really excite the other person across the table. I mean, he'll say, okay, fine. I mean, yeah, it's important, but it's not that important. That is all that I'm trying to say. If you have it at the back of your mind, cooperation becomes easier. It's basically understanding the other person's perspective. That's all. Thank you.
new question. Martin, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Commodore Brooker, Australian Defence. Uh, my question was to uh, Dr. Palmer Rubbles, um, related to, I guess, uh, uh, those organisations that look to bring governments together or cooperation. I wonder whether um, there's sufficient motivation amongst those organisations for cooperation. Um, who needs to influence them? And is there the solution, something around a whole government approach um, that needs to feed into the organisation that is here, but also more, more importantly, the RIM organisation. Thank you for um, the question. And certainly, I believe that the whole of government approach um, is actually a good um, framework for um, countries in the Indian Ocean region, even at the regional um, level. Um, to look at as a model for how we approach uh, regional uh, security um, issues. The whole, um, the whole of government approach can um, be adapted, I suppose, in different levels. One would be at the domestic level where other Indian Ocean countries would uh, have a, whole of a similar whole of government approach and that's being done um, within by other countries in the region. The other is more of a regional sort of um, structure where the approach is similar, but on also um, at a higher intergovernmental and interstate <coughs> um, level. Um, one of the issues, um, you know, our border protection would be um, one of the best examples. It um, it addresses a whole lot of issues, not just illegal fishing, but all other types of illegal activities. Um, the problem that I can see with a regional structure that has a sort of um, a, a has a similar sort of approach is that specifically on fisheries, if you're talking about the management of tuna, you are only talking to um, fisheries departments and at most the, the ministries of um, uh, foreign affairs. There's not enough involvement of the Navy. When the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission um, developed the high seas boarding and inspection, of course there were um, there was a U.S. Coast Guard um, present, but all other delegations didn't have the Navy and the Coast Guards present in the room. And they've developed a system where um, government vessels will be authorized by the flag states to um, conduct inspections of fishing vessels on the high seas. So when that um, conservation measure was adopted, um, the, uh, the members went back to their government saying, we are nominating some of our naval vessels and appointing them to be high seas boarding in, um, inspectors. And a lot of the countries didn't understand what high seas boarding inspection entail. Um, there's a whole international fisheries law backing up the sort of vast that system, who do you, um, do you need to notify the vessel before you board them, um, who can board the vessel, what are the um, rights and responsibilities of the inspector, what are the rights and responsibilities of the fishing vessel, the fishing master. There's a whole lot of, um, you know, um, aspects of that process that are not clear um, to the Navy or the Coast Guard or our enforcement um, authorities. So, um, I suppose within a regional structure, a whole of government approach would uh, certainly be a good example, but we might have to adapt it in such a way that um, fisheries um, ministries will not only be concerned with the aspects of fisheries conservation, but more on the regional con security content um, um, of the whole um, issue. And that starts with having um, navies um, sitting in the same room with um, the fisheries ministries to discuss anything that relates to enforcement, especially on the high seas. Thank you. I think that our time has drawn to a close and I'd like us to uh, thank our three speakers, please. Dr. Probel Ghosh, Dr. Marianne Palmer-Robles and Dr. Alexei Muryevov.